afternoon. I'm going to ask a slightly less controversial question compared to the previous panel. How many of you are wearing fitness trackers? Just raise your hands. I'd say about 25%. Yeah? Q. Yes. About 25% people are wearing fitness trackers. You know, they're probably getting a data about the number of steps. Some of them are getting data about their heart rate. That, you know, some know how much they sleep. Is that helping them become healthier? So I would say it depends. And so um, what we do at IBM is we look at opportunities in which we can translate data into insights. And so what's key is the meaning that you get from that data and how it hopefully impacts uh, changes in your behavior. That ultimately leads to healthier outcomes. They've been around for a while now, uh, fitness trackers as a tech wearable. Um, they, you know, the, the data they provide is usually within silos. So you'll have Fitbit giving you a set of data. I wear a Garmin mm -hmm. wearable. It's giving me a set of data. Um, how are you know? How are they using it to give you that personalized information to give it the relevant context? And so, um, one way I like to think about it, this is the three eyes: the um, instrumentation. So, what's happening now with the Internet of Things and wearables and and different devices? There's extraordinary instrumentation across. Um, different settings and environments that are giving people access to data and information to help them understand their behaviors and things that they do. Um, then it's about interconnectedness. The key here is how we connect that data across the different silos as you reference. And the last piece is intelligence because it's humanly impossible for any one individual or as a physician, it's, I, I, I mean, I was dealing, and I still deal with big data all the time. It's humanly impossible for me to know everything about every patient that I serve, all the stuff in their medical records, all their wearable data information, all the social environmental data, all the genomic data. And so how do we have a system that can look at that data and translate an insight that's personalized to an individual, whether it's a doctor or a patient or a consumer? Well, but that's probably not happening because there's a, you know, a stat that gets thrown around about people buying a wearable, wearing it for a few months, and then putting it in their drawer. Mm -hmm. So how do you convince people to use it, and what is it that they require after they've actually got the wearable yeah. to, to continue using it for you know, healthy outcomes? Yeah, so I, I think a key piece of getting people to connect with the data is the insights and, and creating what I would call engagement. And that engagement has to be personalized to each individual. And so what we often like to frame is that as you think about big data, there's a variety of data sets. You just mentioned several, wearables, social, environmental. Um, weather data is a very impactful um, component of uh, changing people's behaviors. There's clinical data, there's genomic data. There's a volume of data. We know that each of us as individuals will produce 300 million books worth of data in our lifetime. And there's a velocity of that data because there's so many things that we decide on every day um, that impact our health and well-being and the progression as well as the development of chronic diseases. And there's the veracity of that data. Uh, which is some of the data is, 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 is not valuable, frankly. And, and you need to be able to distinguish the junk from the reality. And ultimately, it is about getting meaning and value. And um, if you get meaning and value that's personalized to the individual, then you're much more likely to not only engage with the insights in the data, but also share that data. Right. And this concept of data philanthropy is another important piece. If you look at millennials, they're very comfortable sharing their data if they get something back. Right. I mean, you were telling me an example of how you use it within your own family. I think people would love to know what that is, how you use step counts, which is a very simple metric. Right. So uh, with my family and uh, my wife, uh, my uh, brother, my sister-in-law, and my parents, and I think many of us are in a generation now where we're caregivers. We're looking at parents who are aging and we're looking at ways to engage them and support them and navigate health and the healthcare system. So in this example, my father has a number of medical issues, but um, he's, he's got a Fitbit, and we're on a Fitbit community together, 
And with his permission, he's sharing that. And I have a sense of him and his behavior as it relates to sleep and physical activity. And so what's exciting is that it gives me an opportunity to engage him and nudge him when he's doing well and also query him when he might not be doing well because I can start to see he normally does 9,000 steps a day. Um, 81 years old, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and w but when I see there's changes in his behavior or his sleep patterns, once again, with his permission, then I can engage him and start to see that there might be something concerning that needs to be addressed. And then I put on my doctor hat and I start querying him in that sense. And frankly, it's played a big role in helping me um, prevent certain things like hospitalizations from occurring. Well, so the context is important, right? You said 9,000 steps for a, I mean, a father who's that old, right? 10,000 steps is the number that's thrown around. A lot of you who bring your variable, the first goal you're given is 10,000 steps, mm -hmm. which is an arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. There's no context. It'll depend on what the person is doing. So how do you bring all that together? Give me an example of using all that data together in a, a meaningful way. Right, so I'll give you an example, and, and I actually will f reflect a little bit on my, my own experiences. In, in, so as a physician, as an internist and a pediatrician, I took care of one patient at a time. And there was so, so much of that was personalized, one, one person at a time. And, and then I worked um, in settings that looked at the broader population and, and looked at healthcare policy. And now I'm looking at the role of big data in doing what I would call from population health management to personalization health management. And so context is very important. In my opinion, we do a bit of a disservice to folks when we provide goals that are not personalized to an individual's um, preferences. And so the example of 10,000 steps is often referenced as a goal. But if you have an individual who's got a multitude of medical issues and they're only doing 3,000 steps a day, to tell them that they're going to need to get to 10,000 is, is, in many ways, an unachievable goal. So, but then to personalize it to them and to connect it to other factors, like purpose, why do you want to get healthier? You know, I want to be there for my, to watch my daughter you know, at her wedding, or I want to be there to see um, my uh, grandkids, as my father often says, graduate from college. So how do you personalize that is very important. And I think what's going to be exciting and what is exciting is we're looking at this with Watson Health in ways in which we're connecting different data sets with appropriate you know, privacy uh, security protections and ways in which we can, once again, take advantage of the instrumentation that's occurring, take advantage of the interconnectedness that we could help facilitate and bridge those silos and apply cognitive to bring intelligence and insights that are personalized and predictive. So you, you went from you know, one patient to looking at data many mm -hmm. and back to using that data to personalize it to one person. Mm -hmm. You know, an example you were telling me about was Neutrino, the app that helps mm -hmm. women. How do you do how do you use that data to actually give a meaningful outcome for, for a person using uh, fitness data? Right. So I would uh, some great examples like Neutrino leverages data around people's preferences and some of their um, behaviors, actually fitness data as well to navigate and recommend uh, healthy eating options that could fit with their preferences. Yep. Um, and so that leverages Watson APIs, and those are APIs that this crowd could take advantage of. Uh, WellTalk is another app that has, we've been working with for the last four years, and it leverages, um, once again, that broad range of data sets and leverages Watson's Q&A capabilities, which was the same capabilities that were part of Jeopardy and how, how Watson played a role in, in that quiz show. And it, it provides that feedback personalized to individuals who are asking questions about health and well-being. Um, we've also got an extraordinary app with a partnership with Under Armour. So Under Armour with MyFitnessPal has about 170 million lives worth of data across the globe. And I, I use MyFitnessPal as well. And so part of that initiative is leveraging about four and a half million lives worth of data and providing personalized recommendations like a virtual health trainer to, uh, to nudge you to those healthy behaviors. Once again, leveraging data from wearables, from self-reported behaviors, um, and, and put it, bring it all together and taking advantage of the broader population in a secure, de-identified manner and providing personalized recommendations. And so for people who are using fitness trackers right now, it's not just about wearing something and then 
perhaps sometimes looking at the data, you actually want them to have perhaps a purpose that they are using their fitness tracker for, mm -hmm. and then have like IBM Watson or any other mm -hmm. you know, data analyzing machine that can provide an intelligence output for them. Um, it's not easy to get that today for every kind of person. So Neutrino works for pregnant women. Under Armour is for you know, athletes who are trying to coach themselves. Mm -hmm. um, are you building something that might work for everybody? So there, we at Watson Health believe that we need to be a catalyst and part, have partners to help transform health and healthcare globally and translate that big data into key insights to key stakeholders. So we, we're doing a lot of this extraordinary work with partners like WellTalk and, and Under Armour. Apple is another one that we're working with as it relates to being able to bring that data to our health cloud and health kit research kit and, and care kit. Um, we've got partnerships with the American Heart Association, Cancer Society, Diabetes Association. Um, there's this one partnership that, that, frankly, we just announced a couple weeks ago with Teva Pharmaceuticals, the world's largest producer of generic medications. And I actually think about my daughter, making it personal, who has um, asthma. And she's got two inhalers that she uses, one to suppress her asthma exacerbations and one to rescue it. And we're looking at ways to connect that data from it, smart inhale, make those inhalers smart, to connect it to weather data, instrument it, potentially wearable data, and really be able to better predict and personalize interventions to prevent those asthma exacerbations. Right. And another way I like to kind of frame it is that we, we're thinking about healthcare, which is a very key, so as a physician, I would spend, and, and the most, most precious commodity we all have in our life is time. So as a physician, I would treat patients and typically only have one to two hours a year with them. And so what I'm highlighting here is that there are 8,760 hours in a year that we each have, and we get to choose how we spend those hours. The manner in which we can help transform healthcare to bring in this fitness data, to transform the way doctors think about care and deliver care. So it's not only the typical vital signs of heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and blood pressure, but it goes to things like steps, yeah. sleep, social connectedness, what you choose, what you eat, to be able to connect these data sets that could be wearable data, social data, environmental data, and even genomic data and clinical data to bring it together on a cloud, yeah. secure and protected, allowing an individual to choose how it gets used and shared, and then getting those personalized nudges to help change those behaviors yeah. is a big reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Wonderful. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll conclude by saying, for people who are using fitness trackers, the point is to have all that put together if they want an outcome that will actually make them healthier. Uh, just wearing one is not going to help them. No, wearing and just data on its own is not sufficient. Big data is not sufficient. However, what we have to realize is that 80% of all data is invisible and in formats that are unstructured and not being leveraged. They're in systems of record. And what we believe with Watson, the power of Watson, the power of cognitive, to translate that big data into insights, to be able to do what's humanly impossible, to go through all those data sets, those 300 million books worth of data per individual, and bring an insight that are personalized to individuals with a system that continues to understand, reason, learn, and improve is, is, is very exciting. It's part of why we're in this. And we want to do it with all of you. This is a very key effort where we believe we need a team, we need partnerships, and we have open APIs that entrepreneurs like those who are coming to this conference, those who are online watching, can take advantage of to take the power of Watson to help support and serve the people they do. Wonderful. Well, thank, uh, thank you for all these uh, opinions. Thank you, guys. And, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks a lot.